Oh, good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. My name is Richard Dent. I'm your MC for this afternoon. Um, I was born on Gurnai Kurnai land here in Victoria, and uh, like many people in the room, spend most of my time on Wurundjeri and Bunurong land. And we pay our respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Welcome to our inaugural hybrid meeting. This is an, an historic day. It took us 100 years to get to this. And we all know there's a screening process to get into Rotary, but look at the screen now. Enormous. Um, today, our thanks will be given by Sharesh Makenden, uh, and that will be followed by the loyal toast presented by uh, President Marion. So please ensure that your glass is charged. Uh, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Many years ago, an American anthropologist, Margaret Mead, was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about clay pots, tools, for hunting, grinding stones, or religious artifacts. But no, Mead said that the first evidence of civilization was the 15,000 years of a fractured femur found in an archeological site. A femur is the longest bone in the body linking the hip to the knee. In societies without the benefit of modern medicine, it takes about six weeks of rest for a fractured femur to heal. This particular bone had been broken and had been healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break a leg, you die. You cannot run from danger. You cannot drink or hunt for food. Wounded in this way, you are meat for your predators. No creature survives without a broke, with a, uh, survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. You are meat for prowling beasts. A broken femur that has been healed is evidence that another person has taken time to stay with the fallen has bound up the wound and carried the person to safety and tended them through recovery. A healed femur indicates that someone has helped a fellow human rather than abandoning them to save their lives. Helping somebody through difficulty is where civilization starts, Mead said. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. For indeed, that's all whoever had. We are at our very best when we serve others. So let's make a difference in the lives of the need. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Rotarians and guests, a toast to Rotary and Rotary International. To Australia, sorry. Thank you, please be seated. And for those who are online, you're going to be allocated to a breakout room where you can converse with others who are also online or alternatively take your own lunch break and rejoin us when we reconvene at 1.05 in about 10 minutes. We'll see you then. Members, visitors and guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our 43rd meeting in our 101st year and our first hybrid meeting, where we're also zooming out to our members online. So why don't we give our colleagues online a wave of acknowledgement? Everybody want to wave? There we go. I'd like to acknowledge and thank our member Ken Woolard and Andrew Shaw from Technology Corps who have facilitated the testing of this magnificent technology. Today is an important day in the club's calendar. It's the presentation of the 2021 Young Achiever Awards. And we're very honored to have as our special guest presenter, Dr. Tillman Raffaeo, Nobel Laureate and honorary member of the club and our 2021 award recipients, Human Dang and James Holland. Please stand so we can acknowledge and welcome you to our club. Yeah. Thank 
Also visiting and hosted by the Vocational Service Committee are family, friends, and associates of the awardees, accompanying who from Western Chances is CEO Zach Lewis and Program Manager Ann Connors with James or Hannah Brown, Ty Sardon, and James Guest, Vicky Deek, Carly Smith, Stu Douglas, Brett Ilson, and Cassandra Quinlan. Would you please acknowledge and make these guests welcome too? We also have as our guest and for induction shortly, Amit Toha. And for our special club award presentations, we have Peter Clements, Rob Helm, accompanied by his wife, Beryl, and Murray Verstel, also accompanied by his wife, Irene. Also here and hosted by the, the foundation committee, we have Peace Fellow applicant, Byung Byung. Would you please acknowledge and make these club guests welcome too. We have one visiting Rotarian visitors and guests of members, and that's Vedik Chowdhury, who's accompanying Shanti Bull, and he's soon to be a member of our club. So please make him welcome as well. So now to our induction. Would Ahmed Toha please come forward for induction into the membership of the club? Ahmed will firstly be introduced by sponsor Chris Soteropoulos, and Ahmed's mentor in the club will be past president, Robert Fisher. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my heartfelt pleasure to introduce the new member to our club, Mr. Ahmed Toho, a, a wonderful, Australian and Melbourne uh, citizen, family man, family of seven, if you can believe that, um, heavily involved with charity and lives the, um, the values of Rotary service above self. Thank you. Ahmed. We welcome you as a member of the Rotary Club of Melbourne. Today, you enter an organization of more than 1.2 million members in over 35,000 clubs in more than 200 countries embracing the internationality of Rotary. We believe that you have the personal and professional qualities that will ensure the principles of Rotary will be safe in your keeping. The Rotary badge, which you've received and I hope will wear with pride, indicates your commitment to the object of Rotary to which we all aspire, to encourage the ideal of service above self. We expect that you will become an ambassador from us into the community in which you live, and we ask that you convey Rotary's aims in all that you do. We look forward to your pursuing with us the great work of Rotary. So with this ex expectation, I offer you the right hand of fellowship and ask that members rise and join me in welcoming you to membership of our club. Welcome. I'd now like to invite our newest member, Ahmed, to speak from the podium. <clears throat> Thank you, Marian. Um, I'm really very privileged to, um, to be a new member of Rotary Club Melbourne and uh, Rotary in general. When I got the email um, from, the, from the office, they told me that you have two minutes to introduce yourself. And I said, you know, where are you going to start? <laughs> what are you going to do with two minutes? So um, um, all I'm saying is that I'm very humble and I'm very um, grateful um, to be an, a, a, a new member of, of Rotary. And I'm really thanking whoever, you know, is behind, particularly the talk Chris, who has been uh, working with the community from um, 
all members from all, all, all new ethnic communities. So that's where I met him. And that's where I got the recognition of senior citizens as well. So by working, one of my hat is working with the uh, elders uh, from African communities, from particularly from East African, um, which I really found that they've been left out and not feeling accessing all the services that's available for them um, due to many, many reasons. Uh, one of them is the uh, understanding this, how the system works, the language barriers, and so many others. So I'm also a member of Global Somali Diaspora, whom I, I, I am also the founder. And Global Somali Diaspora um, have 22 countries representative um, globally, and uh, I'm one of the founder. And the reason we set up is to exchange knowledge and understanding how the Western system works <laughs> and how we can raise our children, how we can um, borrow models of, um, that works for our families, um, particularly you know, those who live in the West, particularly America, UK, and others. So we have children, you know, how we can raise our children, what is the best way, or best model to help children. So, but I'm also, um, when I came here 18 years, 19 years ago, I um, had the opportunity to work with um, a lot of services, including mental health services. The reason I joined is because where I come from is war-torn country and there's a lot of um, trauma and other issues as well. So I am very privileged to be a new member. And uh, as you said, I'll follow all the rules and all the guidelines that <laughs> <laughs> that the Rotary um, is based on. I've done a lot of work with uh, many other humanitarian organizations back home in Somalia, including Red Cross, um, um, United Nations Peacekeepers. I've done a lot of, um, and I'm very familiar with all these international NGOs, so I'm very privileged to be a new member and, and a member of the family of Rotary, uh, local and international as well. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Welcome, Ahmed. So would Peter Clements please come to the podium for a special award presentation. The fourth Bridge Award was inaugurated in 2006 by past president Mev Connell. The mighty fourth bridge in Scotland derives its strength from rivets and cantilever principles that are a fitting metaphor for the work of Rotarians. And having an architect be the recipient of this is most fitting. Rotary similarly depends on each member for its strength and durability. The actual trophy has an original rivet, don't know how I may have got that, that was removed during repairs. It is awarded annually to a leader of a team of two or more members whose project or activity is considered the most outstanding contribution during the year. And what a year it's been. Peter Clements was inducted into the Rotary Club of Melbourne on the 23rd of July, 2008 under the classification of architecture schools and has been a quiet but powerful contributor. He has been a group part of Group Central One, the East Timor Committee, and has worked tirelessly in the background on a very special project for Timor Leste. Peter has collected and serviced, repaired and shipped recycled sewing machines to the Canossian sisters in Timor Leste in response to their specific request to initiate sewing workshops in the isolated coffee townships of their Amira region. Peter, as leader, has organized a local service repairman in Melbourne to repair all the old Singer sewing machines, engaged with DIK to ship these, and worked with the Canossian sisters to distribute them. This is another project exemplifying the service above self and one that has so much impact in driving the outcomes of this community who want to be self-sufficient. Distribution of these easy to maintain sewing machines allows families, particularly women, to earn a living and become economically self-sufficient. By establishing these sewing machine workshops in Timor Leste, local people are able to learn the valuable skill of sewing, gain self-esteem, 
recognition and independence and become economically self-sufficient. It is for this project that we have the pleasure in awarding Peter Clements the 2021 Fourth Bridge Award. And I'd now, I'd now like to invite Peter to talk. Thank you very much, President Marion. And I'm very pleased to receive this award. Um, as one of my best friends who's a structural engineer joked to me, he said, well, congratulations, you're now an award-winning architect. <laughs> so if uh, I just uh, say a few words, so thanks for the opportunity to give you a bit of a heads up on how the sewing machines for East Timor project has been going. It's been running now for almost one year. And the origins of the project um, span back to 2017 when I was invited by the Rotary Club of Kew and the Goya Foundation to help design a shade structure to the Knossen Kindergarten in Delhi. And uh, we worked through that and um, had that designed um, in Adelaide, constructed in Townsville, shipped from Melbourne. And it was installed by a local Timorese builder and so we built on that relationship and the success of that project and the Kenoshans kept on moving and they built a small library in a shipping container that I, I did a little bit of help with. And then some of the sisters moved up from the uh, main Delhi campus, which is quite well established, up to the remote town of Amera, uh, where they have a smaller campus of only 200 students in the Coffee Highlands. And it's about three hours drive southwest of uh, Delhi on some pretty rough roads. And when the COVID lockdown struck in mid-2020, I was chatting with the Kenoshans uh, via WhatsApp and asked if there's anything that Rotary could do to help. And they responded specifically that um, Singer sewing machines would help them to sew some face masks. And they knew from previous ships and shipments of sewing machines by Rotary Australia back in around 2010, I think that was the Rotary Club of Glen Ferry, that there was a sewing machine technician in Dilly who could help repair and keep these machines running because they're quite simple. So the concept of refurbishing simple mechanical sewing machines was born. They are electric powered, most of them, uh, some are, are, are treadle, uh, but without the fancy electronics, which means they can be maintained easily and kept running indefinitely. The project was sponsored through the East Timor Committee and Joe Mavros helped put out the word via the club's Facebook page and the Good Karma Network, calling for donations of these simple older machines. And the next day, we had people phoning up to drop the machines off and 15 machines were quickly gathered for the first shipment. We found a semi-retired sewing, mach sewing machine repair shop and had the machines fully serviced before being shipped to Timor. And we learned that the cost to repair and ship each machine via DOK was around $80 each, the first shipment costing $1,200. So the first 15 machines arrived in Dilly in December 2020 and were distributed by the Kenoshan sisters who were acting as our partner on the Timorese side between their main K-12 campus in Dilly and their more remote campus in the township of Amera up in the Coffee Highlands. And without any coaching, the sisters and the students used their own creativity to quickly design and produce several types of cloth bags for use by the students. They also now talk of how they can sew their own school uniforms, and this could become a sub-project to help supply materials. The project continues to evolve and we learn by doing, also known by the technical name of heuristics, i.e. learning by doing. For instance, included in the first bunch of machines was one single overlocker. And we learned it was good practice to pair one experienced sewer with a learner on an adjacent overlocker. So we'll now send more overlockers as well. Also during the shipping, one of the foot controllers went missing. But in the process of finding a replacement, we made contact with a sewing machine repair shop in Geelong, whose main service technician happens to be in the Rotary Club of Geelong and had been shipping similar machines across the Pacific Islands for the last 20 years. So he donated the foot controller and even threw in another machine for free. So today we are continuing to gather the next batch of machines and raise funds for their repair and shipment to Timor. If you would like to sponsor the repair and shipment of machine for only $80, please contact Joe Mavros, the bank details, to make a donation. Thank you and thank you for this award.
Ireland. Congratulations, Peter. I can feel the rivet in there, the weight of it. My goodness. Our next award is the Paul Harris Fellow, which is named for Paul Harris, who founded Rotary with three business associates in Chicago in 1905. The Paul Harris Fellow was established in his honor in 1957. It is a tradition of this club that the naming of a Paul Harris Fellow is based upon the contribution of individual members and deserving members of the community who practice the Rotary motto, service above self. Today, we recognize two Rotarians as Paul Harris Fellows. These two members are connected as they have been pivotal in planning and producing the Centenary Peace Symposium. I now call Murray Verso and Rob Helm to the podium to be rec recognized as Paul Harris Fellows by the club. And I'll read their combined citations. So Murray Verso, welcome. So Murray Verso is a retired general medical practitioner. He joined the Rotary Club of Williamston in 1981 and twice served as president before becoming the governor of District 9800 in 2014-15. And is present, president, presently the chair of the District 9800 Rotary Foundation Committee and a major donor. He's held numerous district roles and responsibilities, too many to mention in detail, but they include as convener of the Rotary Peace Symposium that was held in Melbourne on our centenary in April 2021. Rob Helm was educated at Monash University, graduating with an MBBS as well as a PhD. He received a diploma from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, and a fellowship of the Faculty of Pain Medicine, Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. Rob was also elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Rob was inducted into Melbourne Rotary in 1997 and has been actively involved with the Rotary Peace Program, becoming club chair and then district chair of the Peace Fellowship Committee. He has an outstanding record in the Rotary Peace Program at both the club and district levels. The idea for a peace symposium in Melbourne came from the R100 team at Melbourne Rotary who were charged with celebrating the club's 100th anniversary. Hugh Bucknell, on behalf of the team, approached Professor Rob Helm and asked him to run with this project. The goal was to highlight the work done locally and globally by Rotary to promote peace and the key influence that Rotary has in world forums. A committee was formed, and thanks to Bob Fells and Rob Helm, it included a number of peace fellows. Our District 9800 has produced more peace fellows than any other district in the world, which is quite a, a significant mark. Past District Governor Murray Verso was involved from an early date. Also involved from an early date was our guest today, honorary member, Professor Tillman Ruff. Tillman, who joined with the intent that he commit to a plenary lecture based around his Nobel Prize work with ICANN on denuclearization, soon became much more involved. Several other club members were recruited during the two-year planning process. Past Rotary International President Ian Risley assisted with the securing of Rotary International President Holger Knack to provide the opening welcome. And then past RI President Ravi Ravindra, who opened the second day. The keynote speakers, Tillman Ruff, M Emma Leslie, and Natasha Kirko, were secured by Rob, who also approached Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, the past president of Timor Leste, to be a keynote speaker. He was then secured by Murray. This meant the only two Nobel Peace Laureates in the Asia-Pacific region were involved in the symposium. The COVID-19 pandemic fallout made it impossible to confidently have a face-to-face -face meeting, so it was decided to move to the online format. The University of Melbourne was enlisted to provide the support and to also do some pre-conference presentation filming. The university then took that opportunity to launch its new center for peace building during the symposium. The Honourable Gareth Evans joined Dr. Emma Leslie, Stephen Khalil, and past President Ian Risley in the final plenary session discussing the doomsday clock, and that was chaired by ABC's Ali Moore. They were challenged with addressing the significant global issues threatening peace today, but ended on an optimistic note for the future. The symposium was a resounding success, and both Murray and Rob believed that the format could be adopted to enable more presentations biennially. 
So we look forward to that, perhaps even as a pre-convention event in Melbourne in 2023. So Robin Murray, you have exemplified the enthusiasm and commitment to the ideals of Rotary and are deserving recipients of this recognition and award. For your sustained commitment to service above self, it gives me great pleasure to present on behalf of the board and members of the Rotary Club of Melbourne, your Paul Harris Fellow Award, your citation and photo. Please join me now in congratulating Robin Murray. I'd now like to call on Rob, followed by Murray, and I'll hand over your, your citation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Ro uh, President Marin, uh, Rotarians and guests, I'll be extremely brief. <coughs> um, two points I'd make. The first is that the recordings of the symposium are worth sitting down and listening to and uh, contemplating as to what they had in common. And what they did have in common was that our uh, our guests, uh, speakers, the uh, primary speakers, independently, as far as I could tell, could, were very optimistic uh, about how Rotary uh, could be involved in future movements uh, to advance the cause of peace. Uh, largely because the existing organisations that do this are rigid, inflexible, not trusted, and uh, Rotary is none of the above. So uh, I think that is uh, an excellent uh, place uh, for Rotary uh, to look um, towards future symposia and uh, uh, past uh, international president Ian Risley is keen that we do it again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Marion and members uh, for bestowing this Paul Harris recognition on me. Uh, I must say I was pleasantly surprised when Marion rang me and said that the club had intended to do that, because when I took on the job, I did so with a certain amount of reluctance, kicking and screaming, you might say, because I knew there was going to be a fair bit of work involved, and there certainly was. And uh, But in retrospect, we had a bit of fun doing it, I think. Um, at the time, it didn't seem like that. Um, also, as the uh, district's chair of foundation, I should acknowledge the fact and thank the club for the donation to the Rotary Foundation to make this recognition possible. A thousand US dollars to present a Paul Harris recognition, so that's two thousand dollars the club has donated to make this possible for Rob and I. And I am uh, very grateful to the club for that. The club, I might add, is the uh, best supporter of the Rotary Foundation in Zone Eight, which is all of Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. So full marks to the club. Look, I, I feel a bit embarrassed accepting this award in one way because really the, uh, the, the production was a great team effort. It was a fantastic group of people that were involved. It was Rotarians from around the district, at least six Peace Fellows and quite a number of members of this, this club. And uh, time doesn't permit me to go through all the people that were involved, but I, I, I recognise uh, Tillman and, and Richard who are here. Um, I, can't see that. Oh, Bob Fells, of course. Was there anybody else who's here today who was involved? A number of, uh, Ari, Ari was another one uh, do, doing the social media. But it was a, fantastic to have the support and the keenness that was involved, which no doubt contributed to the success of the conference. So thank you to the club, thank you to uh, the board, and thank you, President Marin. So incredibly well-deserved. Thank you. Another round of applause for our two Paul Harris fellows. So now to a couple of club notices. I'll be very quick. Uh, just a quick update on the Sydney anniversary. Uh, past President uh, Chris Wong and past pre uh, President-elect Dredge Smith and myself attended the Sydney anniversary of their first meeting yesterday. And it was an excellent event featuring our Prime Minister by video and our Governor General and Mrs. Hurley in person. We also met with some other capital city presidents and Chris Wong has some ideas that he's going to um, move around the club with on how we might work together in the future. Secondly, our annual appeal. The annual appeal letters have been issued today. Please give this close consideration as any donation will contribute to the club's activities and projects. 
And thirdly, all members interested in the vocational services or mentoring are invited to attend the next vocational services meeting on Monday, June the 7th at 6 p.m. in the Rotary office, which is, as you know, 15 columns. It will be a relaxed, informative meeting and the first face-to-face -face meeting in 12 months. There will be refreshments to entice you there. And the committee facilitates an expanding range of vacation-related uh, related projects and mentoring programs. And we're keen to connect with members and share ideas and experiences. So it's now time to draw the raffle. Right, so I might call on um, the chair of the day, Iqbal Rita, to come to the podium to take over today's meeting and further introduce our special guest speaker and awardees. Hold on, I'm just going to try and get in here to get the ticket. The winning ticket is, there we go. Uh, it's black, it's an A, and it's 21. Oh, down here. Well done, I'll bring it to you. President Marion, distinguished guests and fellow Rotarians. It gives me a great pleasure to chair today's meeting. It's a meeting that recognizes vocational service of two fine young Victorians. Each year, the Rotary Club of Melbourne recognizes and honors outstanding young achievers with an award and a check of $1,500. In, in choosing a recipient, the, the, uh, the, the candidate must be between 18 and 26 years of age, have demonstrated outstanding success in vocational training, academics, sports, arts, or any business-related activities, and has made a significant contribution in the form of service to the community. This also reinforces the Rotary Club of Melbourne's commitment and support through the years to all forms of vocational services. This afternoon, we will recognize two awardees and present them with the Young Achievers Awards for 2021. For this, we congratulate them. We will also invite our recipients to talk to the club of their experiences and aspirations. And I hope we have enough time for questions because I think we have a lot to learn, to from, a lot to learn from these young people. Our first awardee today is James Holland. Last year, James completed his Bachelor of Law with honors, uh, along with Bachelor of Arts from Monash University. He's currently working for a management consulting company. He has done internship in the United States with a, with a congressman in Washington, DC, along with a local politician and, long, and also with Grattan Institute of Think Tank. In 2018, due to his community work, James was made an Associate Fellow of the Royal Commonwealth Society. He was also named as Australia's top future leader in law by Grad Connect and the Australian Financial Review in 2019, respectively. Please welcome James. Thank you. Um, and Thank you so much for this award. I'm very excited to be speaking here today uh, for two reasons particularly. Um, firstly, I'm very excited to be uh, accepting this award along with Hu Man, who um, we've known each other for many years and she's an incredible leader and um, also a fantastic public speaker. So I'm very excited to listen to her speak. Um, and the second reason why I'm really excited is because it gives me an opportunity to speak to this Rotary Club. Um, I think there's something incredible um, about what you do in the fact that you have the capacity to um, help yourselves and help your families, but then decide to then go the step further and help your communities. I think there's an innate beauty in the ability and the decision to serve. And I would like to use my speech today to talk about um, 
community and talk about the sort of solidarity that uh, the Rotary Club um, put so much time and effort into um, consolidating across the community. And I want to share a story of how my community has helped me overcome things I didn't expect to happen in my life. Because initially, when I was growing up, I didn't put much stock into community, into solidarity, into mateship. I was very much um, very individualistic, very much into meritocracy, the whole idea that if I worked hard, if I um, studied as hard as I could, if I um, took all the opportunities I could, like a child at a sweets table, I would be fine and I would have um, a really good kind of life. And I've had so many opportunities, um, which kind of have been um, brought up. And my goodness gracious, I am so fortunate um, to have had those opportunities. Um, but the thing was, when you're so focused on one part of your life, you sometimes don't see issues coming with another part of your life. My family are quite religious, and um, I knew that my sexuality um, was potentially going to be an issue, and it was. Um, and after years of reconciliation and years of trying to find a way to see eye to eye, um, I thought we had reconciled. Um, and then so for a time, I moved back at home uh, during COVID at the, at the start of last year. And initially, uh, the relationship was good. And I thought that no matter what, um, I'd be in a position to um, communicate and talk my through any issue that I had with them and really just negotiate because I believed in my ability to communicate and myself individually. And then it, it didn't work. I, um, in stage four lockdown, I was kicked out of home. Um, I was asked to leave. Um, and I, I bring it up because uh, I've, I've had so many wonderful opportunities and I've had so many opportunities professionally, um, intellectually at university, but an internship at, in the US with a congressman won't help you when your family is yelling at you and you can't say anything anymore. Having an internship at the Grand Institute won't help you when you get in your car with your laptop, with your charger, and three pairs of shorts and the shirt. I wasn't very good at packing in that mindset. Um, and you start driving, and you don't necessarily know where you're going. I've been incredibly fortunate, but it doesn't help you when you can't sleep that well. And I was always of the belief that I would be able to handle whatever that came my way because I thought I was going to be able to do. And then when I was in that space, I couldn't. I, my leg was broken, my tibia was broken, and I needed someone to carry me, to use the analogy from earlier. And I am incredibly fortunate because I had community that supported me. I had friends who let me stay at their place for months without asking for any money or anything for me. I felt nursed back to health essentially by both my inner community and also my um, community volunteer organization, um, Lord Summers Camp and Powerhouse. I felt like they gave me a purpose that helped me overcome and get back to where I wanted to be as a person. And the incredible thing about that experience was it has empowered me to then be able to help other people and understand other people and try to extend that community out to other people who need it, who want it, who have that need for a sense of belonging. And in the last minute of my speech, I would love to just quickly talk about um, Lord Summers Camp and Powerhouse because they haven't just supported me, they've supported people who come from a refugee background, women um, 
supported um, people who are uh, feeling displaced, people that have intellectual and mental disabilities. And this community um, has a home that's essentially broken. It can't, we have a, a, um, a, a, a building in Albert Park that um, isn't accessible to a good portion of the people that need our services and it's in desperate need of repair. And we also have a plan to make it more accessible to really push it forward into the next 90, 100 years, but we just need help um, in terms of financial support. So I would really encourage you, if you have any capacity to help, um, please let the organizers know who can put you in contact with me or and they just get in contact with Lords in this camp and help us continue helping people like me who just want the opportunity to get back to where we were. Thank you so much and thanks for the award. Thank you, James. Well done. Our second awardee today is Wei Man Deng. She has uh, completed a Bachelor of Science at the University of Melbourne with honors and is a non-residential member of Ormond College. Due to her high academic achievements, she has become an Ormond Scholar. Currently, she is undertaking a Master of Science from Melbourne University in Epidemiology. In 2017, she was awarded a Lane, uh, Lane Beachley Aim for the Star Scholarship and in 2018 was accepted into the Victorian Government Young, and Young Emerging Leaders Program. She's also a recipient of Western Chancellor Scholarship. In 2019, she was also awarded with Bringbank Young Citizen of the Year and Victorian Premier's Volunteer Champions Award. Please welcome women. I just want to say that I love James's voice because it's smooth like butter. I just love it so much. Um, let's play a game, a game of two truths and a lie. Uh, I'll give it to you. And if you get it wrong, you have to take a sip when you work it out. So I'll just say three statements. Pay attention closely. The first one, I've been called lemon before. The second one, I've always been proud of who I am. And lastly, I believe that I have a beautiful future ahead of me. Have you decided which one is a lie? I remember the moment I was called lemon. I'm still hurt by it because I was in music class and the replacement teacher came and he looked at the name of the role and he looked at my name and he said, human. And my friends in the back of the room shouted, no, it's Wayman. And then he said, lemon? And so in that moment came the lemon story of how I came to know as lemon. And that's why I've decided to wear a yellow shirt today to represent the good old days, the lemon days. Uh, still as sour as ever, I guess. <laughs> um, so yes, my name is Wei Man Deng. Um, and uh, I came today to tell my story. Uh, and also talk about why I'm so privileged and proud to have won this award. Because the hardest thing about growing up poor and as a migrant young person is not that you don't have money, because that is a part of the conversation. It's the self-esteem issues. It's the not being proud of who you are and being able to talk about who you are and where you've come from. So which is why the second statement is a lie. I haven't always felt proud of who I am. I remember one situation when I was younger. Uh, my mom worked in a sweatshop and she couldn't afford to take care of me. And my carers, uh, what they did was one of their sons slammed a door into my fingers and crushed my fingers. And her son got away with it. And all she did was just shrug her shoulders and apologize. And that's the reality of being a poor young woman. Your voice doesn't matter and the people around you growing up don't appreciate you because you don't have any leverage in your life. You don't have something that you look up 
and you say, I'm proud of this because you don't have that. The cards you're given are the worst cards in the deck. God, no one likes a spade. You know, it's the lowest card ever. And in fact, I had a lot of those growing up and I was never proud of talking about my story, telling people about who I was, who my family are, because I wasn't proud of it. But despite the hardships that I've faced, I have a meaningful life. I have a life full of love and full of beauty, full of people who love me for who I am, despite the struggles I've come from and despite where I've come from. Much like today, where I'm being kindly supported by two amazing people from Western Chances uh, who've come here to support me and to uh, celebrate today with me. And it's in these moments like this that I truly believe that I have a future ahead of me, a beautiful future. I'm finishing, I'm starting my Masters of Science. I've, this is my third degree. I'm focusing on infectious diseases. I'm applying for medicine next year, hopefully. I'm also considering a PhD. Uh, but there was a moment in my life and in my story where I didn't even think I would get up to this point. But I'm so proud and so happy to be able to be here and tell everyone, yes, this is my dream. And yes, I'll be fighting to the end of the day for the things that I believe in. Because so many young people haven't had the fortunate ability to be here, to be here and say to you that they can build a dream. Because they, their dreams are crushed even before they've even started. And so I'm proud to say that through awards like this, through your support, I get to have a moment where I can feel proud of the things that I've done because those lists of achievements, they're nothing compared to even surviving. Even the survival process is my biggest achievement of all, being able to survive up to this point. And so thank you so much. Thank you all of you for showing up, supporting this great cause and allowing other young people to be recognized for who they are and the things they've achieved, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to call our guest speaker, uh, Nobel Laureate Associate Professor, Dr. Tillman Rowe, AO. Um, he's an Associate Professor in the University of Melbourne, uh, Nostal Institute of Global Health, which he established. He has been co-president of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. He's also a co-founder and Australian chair of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. He's a proud grandfather of two good-looking grandson and granddaughters, and one grandchild is on the way. He's, he's not a very keen indoor person, but um, he likes to enjoy his activities outdoors. Uh, please welcome Dr. Tillman Rowe. Thanks very much. Um, what, uh, what a great privilege to hear such uh, courage and leadership and honesty from two clearly very outstanding young people. I think we're honored by their presence and an extraordinarily appropriate awards, which might, it's now my honor to present. So James, I think you have an idea of what's in the envelope. <laughs> Still surprised. But there's a, perhaps let's turn it around for the, for the picture. I'm really honoured to present this to you on behalf of the Rotary Club of Melbourne and, um, and Huay Man. Congratulations, both of you. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, it's hard to, to share things that have hurt and, and you've done so with extraordinary dignity and, um, and I think helped us all feel good about giving you this award and about admiring 
your courage and leadership in, in overcoming some, some important challenges. I think we have some time for, for discussion. Um, so this is an opportunity really for all of us to engage um, with Wayman and, and, and James, offer questions for them. I might just start with, with one for each of you. If there's one person outside your own family to whom you're most grateful, who would it be? I guess I'll start. Um, the one person I'm always grateful for is my nominator uh, to Western Chances. Uh, that, that woman changed my life because, you know, sometimes when you look back in your life and you say there's a before and after moment, that scholarship, Western Chances, changed my, the course of my life forever and allowed me to continue my education for further. Thank you. Um, if there was one person, um, uh, well, Hannah was sitting in the front uh, table with me um, who was supporting me um, in the, some of those harder moments uh, with my family. We have about eight or nine minutes. So I'd really like to, to open it up to, to you to, to engage in conversation with, with Huayman and, um, and James. So we have a roving mic. So please raise your hand if you'd like to say something, ask a question. Thank you. Just pause a question to both of you. If you come back here in 10 years, what do you think the world would be like? I, I'm, I'm optimistic because there's, um, there's so many problems, as we all know, um, but there's so many people who are keen to take on those challenges. And I do believe that there's an inherent desire to improve the world out there if it is given an opportunity by the, the structural, um, the structures of, that, of government and of society generally. So I'm optimistic. I'm also optimistic because I think that if there's just even one person left who believes that there can be change, then there can be change. It may not be big change. We might not change the world, but we can change the world for one person and one person's life can be more beautiful and more meaningful. And that's, that's what matters. Thank you. Thank you. You're both working with young people. Can you give us some sense of what you see as some of the challenges that we can work with constructively with young people, particularly, Wayman, you've talked about some of the struggles of what we see as a privileged Melbourne University student, and yet you were feeding them during COVID. So what are some of the things that we can do, and how does your leadership award help you open those doors? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Marge. Um, one of the biggest issues have, you know, affecting the lives of young people is mental health. Uh, I think a lot of communities don't even recognise that that's a big issue. But for young people, being able to process the, the issues they're facing, processing the trauma that they've experienced, those are one of the biggest issues, especially last year. Last year, young people were hit so hard, losing jobs, uh, being separated from their families. And yet, you know, Life has kind of gone to normal, but for these young people, it hasn't. And so it's, we need to really recognize the struggles that they've faced. Um, in my role as the welfare officer, a lot more young people are requiring and requesting welfare. And so this award um, helps me, helps them by giving me the more strength and more uh, power, willpower to continue my work, even though there are a lot of hardships in what you do when you do community work. And many of you here would know but it's believing that somebody else believes in me and therefore I must continue. I think one of the, the biggest concerns of, um, that's facing young people is disillusionment. Disillusionment with government, disillusionment with our current society, 
uh, a distaste for the kind of structures that we have, because um, that leads to a, a sense of um, pointlessness, which links back to Raymond's uh, I, idea around mental health, but also a sense of um, wanting to change things and potentially not always for the better. Uh, and to combat that, uh, the, the best way to combat disillusionment is of a sense of belonging. Um, and one of the best ways, there's so many ways to create a sense of belonging, but um, through altruistic organizations like this one, um, the, so much belonging and sense of, um, a sense of uh, community can be built for young people. So altruistic organizations are a fantastic way to do that. Time for one more. The word change came up a moment ago, and I'm just very interested in the upcoming members of the next leadership generation as to what kind of change do you think that your generation should be pursuing in order to bring about the right kind of change? Uh, I, and I think the world we live in today is certainly a changing world, and it's an awful sight to behold. And somehow or other, we haven't thought hard enough, our generation, as to what you don't want to do when you seek for change. Please, just anything that either of you could say would be very good for our generation to hear. <laughs> it's a brilliant question. And we've just had a little discussion uh, <laughs> about what we think the answer is, and honestly, I don't think there's one answer. I think when I think about something that will be important, it's communicating the importance of incremental progress, um, particularly when it comes to issues that are both social, environmental, and communicating the worthwhile of going one step at a time instead of just doing a whole big structural kind of revolution, um, which can then lead to vulnerable people being um, uh, falling through the cracks. Um, so incremental progress and communicating that value would probably be my answer. You can tell we're debaters because we were discussing it. This is what's friendship, guys, I love it. Um, I actually, the first thing that came to mind was um, climate change and the environment. I think that going for, forward, and one of the things that I'm working on is how we can reduce the impact that we have on the environment, whether that's reducing the plastic that we use and just being really conscious of the things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to make the environment uh, and the planet a gift to our future generations rather than a burden to our future generations, because that is a lasting impact that will affect all future people, um, especially the future children. And many of you here have families, and I know we want to all leave the families up the best possible version of the world. And, um, I want to do that as well. And so I think that is the one change that we can make, which is working together on a day-to-day -day basis to do our small bit for the environment and our communities. Thank you both very much. Well, I think you've seen in spades why we have such extraordinarily inspiring and deserving winners of, of, of this award. Thank you very much for your insights and your willingness to take our questions. Um, in closing, I, I guess just a very few reflections from me. Leadership is a renewable resource and nobody has a monopoly on it. Thank goodness for that. And inspiration and passion and wisdom uh, also, nobody's monopoly um, can be present in everybody. Uh, and we've been reminded very poignantly and courageously about the importance of respect and inclusion for every single one of us. And I'm proud that that's such a fundamental and pervasive value that's celebrated in Rotary. Thank you both. We wish you all the very best and we'll be 
watching your next steps, keen to hear about them uh, with great interest and every good wish. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tillman, James, and Wayman. Now I'll pass the mic to our president to close off the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our presenter, um, Tillman Ruff, our chairman, Iqbal Reta, our visitors and guests for attending. Thank you also to our production team, including Ken Woolard and Andrew Shaw, lunch and reception teams, MC Richard Dent, and congratulations to our newest awardees, Peter Clements and Paul Harris Fellows, Rob Helm and Murray Verso. And finally, thank you to all of those who joined us on Zoom. Do you want to do a final farewell to those on Zoom? Thank you for joining us today. And a reminder that next week is our monthly members lunch, which will be held online only on Zoom. So please stand to close the meeting with the national anthem. <laughs>